Okay, um, Assalamualaikum and good morning everyone. Um, I would like to thank everyone for joining our monthly neuro emergency um, CME. Okay, so I think if I'm not mistaken, this is the sixth time that we organize a CME so that uh, we can have an update from time to time in, in regards to neuro emergency. So um, I will, today our speaker would be um, Dr. Ahmad Khairuddin. Uh, sorry, Dr. Hairuddin bin Ahmad Sankala. Okay, he uh, basically um, graduated from UITM in the year of 2009. Okay, and then um, he uh, used to work in uh, Kemaman Hospital, Hairuddin. Eh? <clears throat> I think uh, you must have known um, one Faraliza who is currently my colleague in Putrajaya Hospital. And um, uh, he um, continued his uh, further study in uh, radiology um, in UMMC um, up to 2017. I was posted to um, Tawau Hospital. So basically, I came to know about Dr. Hairuddin uh, from my colleague in Tawau. And it is such an honor to know that he has a lot of interest in um, neurological uh, related uh, uh, things lah. Okay, so currently uh, he is doing his fellowship eh, under, is it under Royal College of uh, Radiology, if, if I'm not mistaken? Is it correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that's basically my, uh, my master lah. Okay, all right. Okay, so um, currently he's working in HKL. Eh? Okay, so he's, he's doing his subspecialty in um, neuroradiology. So we wish all the best to him. And today um, we are very um, honored to have him to present on a topic of a role of uh, imaging in stroke. Uh, and we just had our recent Malaysian stroke conference. Okay, so it's like uh, uh, we can basically uh, have a look again, okay, on what are the modalities and uh, what are the imagings that can be used, okay. So we hope that this will complement on whatever that uh, you may have seen or heard uh, from the Malaysia Stroke Conference itself. So without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Hairuddin Bin Ahmad Sankala to proceed with uh, his presentation today. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much Dr. Nasrina for a very kind introduction. So, uh, so I'm today my topic will be on role, role of imaging in stroke. Yeah. Um, <coughs> sorry. So before we start any further, we go any further, I just want to take one of the hadiths from uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that uh, said, acquire knowledge and impart it to the people. So it's uh, basically what uh, our daily, uh, our, I mean, uh, what is encouraged for us doctors, we have to learn even we don't have exams especially the medical officers we, we, it's not just uh, not going for exam we also have to learn and uh, okay so these are the questions of my uh, presentation today um, more on uh, city meeting because this is basically uh, uh, the most commonly readily available imaging so a bit of concept of CT and anatomy, and then go on uh, different different uh, timing of strokes, acute, subacute, and all infarcts, and also uh, the changes, aspect score, and a bit on CTA and CT perfusion. I know this is not quite common uh, to have uh, in all the centers, but I'm just gonna briefly go through CTA, CT perfusion, as well as uh, MR imaging. Then uh, I'd like to show some of my uh, some of uh, local cases uh, from uh, HKL also. Okay, so uh, when I'm asked what is the role uh, of imaging in stroke, it's basically like you know showing uh, the universe. There are so many things that we get. There are so many roles of imaging. First thing is, the, you, first thing you have so many modalities. You have a variety of uh, modalities. You have CT scans, I mean MRI, and an angiogram. Then after that, you also have for each modality you have different different use. For example, to diagnose uh, stroke. To, uh, uh, to follow up the, and then to guide for your management and so on and so on. Okay, so before we go uh, to the uh, anatomy, I just wanna show you the uh, uh, CT scan in axial section in a, a plane scan. So basically this patient presented with 14, uh, this 49 years old patient, presented with left-sided body weakness. And this is, from this CT scan, we can actually see uh, stroke changes. I know it's very subtle, but from the CT scan, we, uh, so, 
what are the questions that arise from this is where is the abnormality? Is it on the right or the left? How to make it more conspicuous? And how to describe the abnormality? And is there any white matter or gray matter involvement? And what are the features of stroke in this particular scan? So uh, hopefully by the end of this presentation, uh, we'll be able to answer all these questions and we'll, we'll go back to this uh, particular patient. Okay, so uh, a bit on uh, introduction to the CT imaging. So I know this is, I think some of you might are familiar with this, but I just want to go through it. Concept of CT brain, decidedness, decidedness. So you have to know whenever the patient, when there's abnormality on the uh, left hand side, it's basically on the right side of the patient. So you have to know it's basically crisscross. Lah. So when you have abnormality on the uh, on your right hand side, it's basically on the left hand, uh, basically on the left side of the patient. So it's it's uh, the other the other way around. So you have to know that. It's, it's, similarly, this is the same thing that you can see on uh, uh, chest X-ray as well. Okay. So uh, concept of CT brain, and then second concept is basically windowing. Okay. This technique. Uh, before we go to the windowing, I just want to show you how the scan is performed. So when you perform a CT brain, it's very basically very fast. The Scanning is just, I think it's less than one minute. So patient will lie on the couch and then uh, this is the gantry. And then <clears throat> you only will scan the patient once. If you're doing a uh, plain CT brain, basically you only will scan the patient once. However, you'll be producing many, many images. For example, this one, you're producing so many images from one, one, uh, uh, from one set of uh, CT brain. So how do you do that? So basically, you use the technique of windowing. Windowing is basically a post-processing technique. So you, you try to highlight certain structures and you try to blur out certain structures. For example, you want, if, you wanna, if you're using brain window, basically you are uh, highlighting the brain and then you are trying to su suppress other, uh, other structures, for example, the bones. And then sub similarly for subdural window to look for subdural bleed, and then this is what is important for stroke, the narrow window, and also other 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 windowing windowing techniques would, would be bone soft tissue and a lung window. Okay, so uh, unfortunately, not all uh, hospital will have this capability of doing windowing uh, because uh, some of the hospital, especially for the emergency department, you are only given the uh, printed film. So if you have printed films, you will be only be given two sets of images, which is one is this one, when uh, brain in uh, brain window, another one is in a uh, bone window. And the subdural window or narrow window for stroke uh, is not, uh, are not provided. So uh, for the hospital the computer system, you have, when you have computer in your uh, own working place, so it's easier for you to manipulate the image. So basically, for example, in Putrajaya, I, I believe this is uh, they are using a computer system, so the clinician can actually change the window and it's automated. You can just click, just a single uh, click button. So if brain window, uh, so all this numbering you don't have to remember, but for radiological clicks, this is uh, compulsory to, to memorize. And then you have the brain window, basically you want to look at the brain structure, and then you have subdural window, which is good for even for stroke, because sometimes patient can have bleed, and then the bleed can actually be accentuated with this window. And then you have not narrow window or stroke window. Some people use different kind of window, but this is personally I, I like to use this one. I'm gonna I'm gonna show a few cases using this window later. And then uh, lastly, bone window, especially for trauma cases. Lah. And then a soft tissue window. This is normally also for trauma cases when you have basically when you look at the scalp. You try to look for a cup hematoma. So this is the best window. I'm a window also for trauma. To look for any pneumocranium because the gas will be accentuated within with uh, this particular window. Okay. Uh, next is we use a concept of density. So density is basically the, the term that we use to describe. I think I'm I'm, I'm sure that you have to read our uh, radiology report saying okay there is hyperdense structure or the hyperdense lesion so that's basically the, the the terminology that we use so it's, it's I think it's crucial or it's important for you guys to know that uh, how what are we describing or using all these terms so basically uh, we are in a in a in a uh, imaging how do we describe a lesion basically we compare it to to the certain structure that we are, we are imaging for example 
we are imaging the brain. So when you have a lesion, we try to compare it to that particular structure, which is the brain in, this, in the case of CT brain. So when a lesion which is brighter than the brain, we call it hyperdense. So the word here is dense. So when it's a uh, lesion is equivalent, for example, this one, subdural, subdural bleed, is equivalent to the brain structure, particularly the gray matter, we call it isodense. And then when it is darker than the brain, it will be hypodense. So similarly, this is the, the term hyper, iso, and hypo are used for all, I mean, most of our imaging reports. For example, on, on ultrasound, we are using sound, so you're using echo. So if it's bright, let's say you are scanning the liver, if it's brighter than the liver, it will be hyper echoic. Same with the liver, we are isoechoic. So basically, this is the term. Why am I stressing this out? It's basically because um, it's very it's, it's good for you. We can have the same language. We can have the same terminology while describing, uh, you know, while describing the scans. Okay. And then, uh, and it, uh, gray and white matter. This is important for 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 diagnosing a stroke. So you have to know which one is gray matter, which one is uh, white matter. So on CT scan, unfortunately, white matter is not really white. It's black. It's at the center. So it appears black here, and it's surrounded by the grayish appearance of this structure which are the gray matter so uh, so we have the superficial gray matter and we have the deep gray matter deep gray matter this is uh, i think everyone knows this basic ganglia so basic ganglia uh, is the components are the lentiform nucleus and caudate nucleus so when you have bleed here normally we just call it or stroke here we call it uh, basic ganglia bleed and then uh, we have thalamus as well so when you have uh, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, gray, gray matter structure, uh, common site for infarct, common site for bleed. And then uh, another thing that we have to uh, pay attention to is the insular region. This is also a common site for stroke. Okay, and then the brainstem and cerebellum. So uh, sometimes, uh, personally, I think when I was uh, in training, it is something that I normally like try to, uh, I, I tend to miss. Uh, the, the brain cell infarct and also the cerebellar infarct. So normally when patient comes with right-sided or left-sided body weakness, I'll, I'll, I tend to just focus on the, uh, the supratentorium or the, cere the cerebrum, not looking at the uh, pons and the midbrain uh, with the brain stem. But uh, you have to bear in mind that this particular structures for CT scan is quite tricky because it tends to have uh, uh, artifacts. Okay, so for example, at this particular region, so we have dense bones here. So dense bones normally will, will take up the X-ray photon. So this will cause darkening at this region. So that this is artifactual where you have uh, hypodense, where you have dark band around the uh, pons. But compared to the infarct, infarct will be limited within the brainstem structure. It won't go out. Like this one is basically has gone out beyond the uh, brainstem structure. So, uh, So uh, just, uh, just go through the brain structure. The love-shaped structure here is basically the midbrain. And then the second one will be the pons. And then the lower one, just before the spinal cord, will be the medulla oblongata. And we have the cerebellum. OK. And then uh, another term that I think uh, you, you must have read before in our reports are the centrum cerebral valley and corona radiata. This is important in, in the term of lacuna infarcts. So lacuna infarcts normally will be like a small infarct, uh, will be focusing on just the white matter. So the centrum cerebral valley and corona radiata basically describing the white matter uh, uh, at this particular region. So when you, uh, so by using the lateral ventricle as a landmark, so when the, you can still see the lateral ventricles and you have infarct in the white matter at that particular region, you can call it a corona radiata. The moment is beyond the ventricle, meaning you have you scrolled up and then uh, the ventricles are no longer there. So basically, if you have infarct somewhere here, you call it a centrum semia valley. So basically, just terminology, uh, infarct within the white matter. Okay, uh, lastly for anatomy is the CSS spaces. Uh, this is important. I'll, I'll tell you why, but before that, we go through the anatomy. So uh, you have like finger-like projection that projects within the CSF. So within the CSF structure this is what we call it as gyrus, uh, singular gyrus, multi, uh, plural will be gyri. And then in between this indentation, you have this like, longkang. So this is what we call as sulcus. So uh, all this brain will, will have all this gyration and also sulcation. 
So what is important in terms of stroke? Because stroke will cause edema. Edema will further cause mass effect. So mass effect will, will cause effacement of this. So the, the south side will efface. And then you can actually, this is basically an indirect clue to tell you something wrong within uh, the adjacent brain parenchyma. Okay. And then arterial territories, uh, uh, clinicians, normally the uh, neurologists will try to, uh, they, they like to call it like in one anterior circulation or posterior circulation. In, in HCL, they, they prefer anterior circulation and then posterior circulation. So anterior circulation basically comp uh, comprises of MCA and SCA. And then, uh, and, uh, but unfortunately, I mean, not unfortunate, not unfortunate, but MCA is basically the most common site of infarcts followed by PCA, um, followed by posterior circulation and SCA is the least side. So it's, it's, it's good if you, want, if you know the pattern, so you can actually know uh, the involvement. And then uh, normally infarct will, will just, will respect their boundaries with it. They don't go to the, uh, beyond the, their boundaries. So that's how you know, that's how you differentiate between infarcts and other uh, pathology. Okay, so this is uh, an example of infarct in the anterior circulation. Example of infarct in the uh, uh, MCA. So this one is ACA, and this one is MCA, and this one is uh, PCA infarct. So uh, where do we start as clinician? How do um, uh, some? I mean, my, some of my friends who are clinicians they normally ask me how how do we start to to reviewing the images? Do we start from the bottom? Do we start from the top? Or do we start from lateral side? Changing the window? Which? How do we start? So for those with films, which are provided with films, I I I, uh, I personally will start from the bottom. But uh, but I would suggest for uh, non radiological people, you can start. This is just my suggestion. You can start from the top. The top would be why because it will be like less crowded. So if, for example, you compare the uh, the the caudal part of the brain and the cranial part of the brain. So the caudal part. Uh, it's very messy. You have the bone structures, you have the ear structures, the sinuses. You'll, you'll get distracted. So you tend to like, you know, you get overwhelmed at the beginning of the scan. So might as well you just start something, you know, something which is lighter. You have just the brain structures, CSS spaces and the bone. So you just focus here and then make sure that the brains, the brain is symmetrical in order for you to compare it. You know, God has created the brain to be uh, some, somewhat symmetrical so you can actually compare it side by side, side by side. To, 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 to detect any abnormality. Then you scroll down, it's okay to go down, up and down, up and down, that's, that's, that's no problem. Okay, so uh, like I said, look for, look for gross abnormality, look for hyper, area of hypodensity or any area of bleed. And then uh, for those who have the capability of changing the windows, uh, for radiological stuff, it's a must, it's compulsory for you to change the window, not you know, just re reviewing the brain window, I mean the brain scan, just using one window. So you have to change to all these windows, even the, the suspicions are not there. Let's say the clinician wanna, just wanna roll up skull fracture and bleed. You, do, you still have to look for any evidence of stroke because you know, a trauma can also cause, cause a stroke because of dissection. And then uh, also if you have the capability, you can also go, go through, just make sure that uh, all the other sections you have to review. We have to review the axial section, we have to review the coronal section and also the sagittal section. But uh, uh, for I mean for the non radiological uh, colleagues, I think it's okay if you if you if you're not familiar with all these sections. But for radiological team, this is this is something that you have to go through uh, for for all the scans. Okay, so now we've uh, we've reached we have we have come to this uh, stroke topic. So basically, uh, stroke is most of the time is uh, ischemic stroke. 85 of the of 85 percent of the cases, and then uh, for now they have introduced the uh, time is brain. Uh, so meaning is because it's very uh, time. Is, I mean brain is something that you have to salvage urgently because like roughly uh, about two million of cells will die within one minute without a treatment, and then if you have if you delay, there will be 38 percent of uh, functional outcome of the patient, and then uh, this is understandable if you have a larger uh, infarct the outcome for the patients will be worse compared to patients with smaller infarct. And then if you have a proximal occlusive thrombus, meaning if you have a thrombus somewhere here at the ICA compared to thrombus somewhere here uh, of the MCA, this infarct will be definitely, this thrombus will definitely cause more harm compared to those uh, thrombus somewhere here because the larger area of coverage. 
Okay, so we also have zones, different different zones of infarct. When you have an infarct, you have uh, three different zones. The first one is the core infarct, the penumbra, and also the oligemic area. So the core is basically an area that is already infarcted. If you do something or if you do not do anything, it will be the same. There's there's no change for this particular area. So this is like a golden case area. And then second one, you have the penumbra. This is what is important. This, this is what you have to try to, to, to have a look, to try to find how big is a particular area. That's why we do CT perfusion and MR perfusion. Uh, so, uh, so penumbra is basically area which, is, which has reduced blood flow and still salvageable. And then we have the oligemic area. So uh, definite, uh, stroke is basically a term that we use in uh, when patient present with neurologic, neurological event, uh, also called a cerebrovascular, uh, cerebral, cerebrovascular accident or brain attack. And it can be because of atherosclerotic disease or small vessel disease, and also cardioembolic disease. And like I said earlier, uh, MCA is a common site, while SCA is the least common. So for centers which have um, stroke, um, stroke service, normally, they will try to, to use the term of hyperacute, meaning patient present within six hours uh, of symptoms. And then uh, followed by acute is six to 48 hours, 48 more to two weeks is subacute and the old or chronic infarct to be two weeks and beyond. But some centers, we don't have the stroke, we don't have the stroke service. Basically all this, these two will be lumped together under uh, acute infarct. Okay, so, what do we do when we have a suspicion of infarct from uh, the emergency department? So we, we perform plain CT. We, uh, we don't do a contrast for stroke patient uh, most of the times. So if there is any bleed, if there's any bleed, then we send it to neurosurgeon and they will do the net full. And then we, uh, in centers like in HKL, we do a CTA. CTA basically want to look for any treatable, treatable occluded vessel. So not all occluded vessel can be treated with a uh, thrombectomy. Uh, so the CTA is basically to look the site of the thrombosis. So if, if you have somewhere here within the M M1 segment of the MCA, so that is treatable, meaning they can actually retrieve it, uh, retrieve the, the thrombus. But if you have somewhere area around here that, that is uh, quite difficult to get it, so it's very fast. So normally we don't, uh, the IR team won't do anything for the, for the distal thrombus. And then sometimes we proceed with CT perfusion or MRI and MR perfusion to look for uh, core infarct and penumbra if you, you know, if you want to proceed with further treatment. Okay, so this is basically the same thing. CT brain to detect infarct to exclude hemorrhage and stroke mimics. Stroke mimics like tumor uh, or you have a, a mass effect by the tumor. And then also we want to use CT brain to actually to follow up the progress of the CT scan. I mean, of the, of, of the stroke. And then CTA to detect any intra-anterior thrombus for mechanical thrombectomy, and then to detect viable and non-viable tissue. So what are needed uh, when you uh, request for imaging for stroke? So basically it's very important to have the symptoms and the affected site. So you have to tell us whether it's right side, uh, left side generalized or not, because that, that will help us to actually to focus one particular brain, especially when the stroke is very is in hyperacute, it's very difficult for us to find the stroke. Uh, and then the time of onset is also very important because if you if you present, you know, if you, uh, for example, some, you know, when medical officers when they call me, they want to request for CT brain plane to look for stroke, and then I, and then they're not sure what time of the stroke, then normally I will advise them to actually to to find what is when is the time, and then if it's less, if it's within the, the window period period, they have to actually alert the neuro neurologist rather than just requesting themselves so we can actually plan what do we have to do next do you have to proceed with CTA prevision you have to proceed with CTA so all these are needed so you have to really really correct the history to get the time of onset and then vital signs especially blood pressure because some patients they present with stroke and at the same time they also have this hypertension emergency uh, I mean prolonged hypertension period so this can be detected on CT scan. Uh, so we can actually see uh, changes on the CT scan. So the, the, I mean, the, the blood pressure, especially the blood pressure uh, would be very helpful. And then your examination. So sometimes whether it's very dense or you're not really sure if, if you were not, whether the weakness is not really there. So that's very good if you tell us what was the power like and then your clinical suspicion. So for my friends, uh, the clinic, my friends who are clinician, I always advise them to list, list down all their clinical suspicions. You don't have to feel like, 
okay, I'm, I'm scared this diagnosis will, will sound so stupid, so I don't want to put it down, but it's okay because we can basically answer your question. So let's say you think, okay, could it be this, could this be stroke or could it be this, could this be demyelination? So you can just put it down. You can, I, uh, and then I also advise my medical officer to always answer the clinician's clinician question. So what you want to rule out have to be answered at the end of the report. So uh, then these are the changes. Uh, I said uh, acute stroke. So I've said uh, quite difficult in a very early stage of the stroke in, 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 in hyperacute phase. So the first one is loss of basic ganglia definition. So I've uh, shown you earlier how basic ganglia appear. So basic ganglia is a gray matter structure. So it will appear denser than the white matter. So you can actually see here, one, one here, another one here. Unfortunately, on the right side, you can't really see the demarcation. It's, not, it's, it's becoming darker and it's basically the basic ganglia has lost its uh, characteristic. So this is what we call as loss of basic ganglia definition. Normally, can be seen in very acute or hyperacute stroke. And then insula ribbon. We have insula ribbon, which is this pro, uh, finger-like projection, sort of like the gyrus that I've shown you earlier. So loss of insula ribbon means this interdigitations or the finger-like has basically gone effaced because of the mass effect. For example, in this particular patient, we have loss of uh, uh, the the insular ribbon and uh, even the CSS spaces at that at the insula is has gone. So this is basically because of the mass effect, one of the uh, early signs of stroke. Then uh, third one would be the dense MCA sign. It's not just MCA; it's it's also for uh, other 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 vessels that could be uh, could be used. I'm just going to show you one example. So if you have a hematoma within the, the brain, it will appear as hyperdense. So it's basically a blood clot within the brain parenchyma. So similarly, if you have a blood clot within the, within the blood vessels, it will also appear hyperdense because of they are, they are basically the same thing. They are also stroke. So if you have MCA, so it will be a hyperdense, it will be bright on the, on the MCA. So you have to compare it to the other side. Does it appear the same or does it appear more dense? Then that would actually help your suspicion. And then if it's basically in the basilar artery, it also will appear like that because it's basically a blood clot. Similarly, in the distal vessel, like in this particular case, we have multiple, uh, 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 what we call that, uh, blood thrombus within the distal vessels. So, um, this is one of the insular, loss of insular ribbon just now, I, I, I skipped the slide. So for, you can compare it here. You have CSS spaces here. And then basically this, uh, the ribboning or the interdigitations of the insula has gone. And then basic CSS spaces is lost. And then apart from that, you can actually see the white, met, I mean the gray matter of the basic ganglia has lost its characteristic. It become more hypodense now. And then another sign is the the ventricles becoming asymmetry. So you, can, so you can compare the other side because of the mass effect, stroke here causing edema and then compresses, displacing the brain parenchyma more medially and more laterally. Okay, another uh, dense vascular, vascular sign we have uh, uh, in the M2 segment of the right MCA. Okay, just gonna show you several examples. And then weight shape uh, hypodensity. Weight shape hypodensity, uh, uh, basically, if you have a large MCA infarct, this what it will appear. It will appear as a weight shape hypodensity area. So it's very important that you re you have to uh, realize that stroke will involve a large stroke will actually involve the white matter and the gray matter. So that's why I introduced the term of white white matter and gray matter because it's com if you want to compare it to when you have a lesion like for example this one, you also have a hypodensity but it's limited within the white matter only. It doesn't go all the way. It doesn't affect the gray matter. So when we give contrast, this is truly not, inf this is not an ACA territory. Inf I mean, this is not a, a inf ACA infarct because we can actually see that there's actually uh, enhancing mass within that particular region. So the important uh, uh, take home message would be large infarct will involve the white, gray and white matter. When, we, when you see something like this, uh, this basically would be uh, non uh, non infarct edema lah. We call it as basogenic edema. So I used when I was uh, I used to be an EDMO in Klang last time. So when I was EDMO, I used to refer H to HKL 
one case of like this, and I call it a large infarct. So uh, you know, this is basically a tube patient basically has has got tumor but then i wrongly have you know referred patient to hkl for a large area of infarct and then uh, i think i'm sure you also have heard this uh, aspect score for center we have a stroke a stroke service this is very important you have to tell the clinician how bad is the uh, infarct so basically uh, at, uh, the aspects uh, aspect score is basically want to tell the clinician you have to uh, ha in quantitative way to tell that okay this this patient has got better infarct or worse infarct so you have this area so you have the basic ganglia basic ganglia will comprise of two the caudate nucleus the lentiform nucleus and then the internal capsule and you have the insular region this will be comprises of four and then you have m1 m2 m3 m4 m5 and 6 so i have a very funny mnemonic to remember this uh, i don't know if you can use it so i use uh, it's basically click, as you like C L I I C. So click, and then you have M1, M2, M3, M3, six. So this M M is very easy because you have just you have six, and the four is basically C L I I C. So uh, is this the 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 quantification is best done? Uh, I mean not best done, but if you do it very early in the stage of the patient, you sometimes you will be underestimating the uh, the severity of the stroke. And then a uh, score of less than eight, which between seven, seven and less would be uh, associated with poor outcome. But uh, in HKL, sometimes even if, if, even with seven, uh, scoring of seven, they still proceed with thrombolysis or thrombectomy. Uh, it depends on your center. Uh, because eight, nine, 10 is very, actually, you, 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 if you have like eight, it's basically you just have, have gone two structures. That's, that's quite rare to have. Sometimes some patients will, some will present with four, three. So the structure will be, I mean, uh, I mean the involvement will be more. So to translate uh, the diagram on CT scan, this is what would it, it would appear. So you have the cardiac nucleus and then the lentiform nucleus. You have the insula, insula here and the internal capsule. Internal capsule is basically the white matter structure. Okay, and then you have M1, M2, M3, M4, M5, and M6. So uh, for each, uh, affected area for each affected area you have to minus one mark one mark so let's say you have one uh, you have a uh, example i give you here you have involvement of the lentiform nucleus the internal capsule and the m2 so this would become aspect score of seven so and so on and so forth okay so uh cta of brain uh like i said is basically to provide side of occlusion and collateral information. This is basically something that I'm very interested in, uh, collateral information. In, uh, we, in HKL, we report it on, uh, we give report based on the uh, collaterals, whether it's good collaterals or bad collaterals, but uh, most of the time we don't, they, they don't really, we don't really, this information don't really guide uh, the clinician to make a uh, treatment, but uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes they do take it as part of their, you know, it's like a part of their collective way of measuring, okay, this patient, we can proceed despite this, despite aspect score is less, but you know, the collectors, the collectors looks better, okay? And then uh, we also do CTA carotid, meaning we extend, we extend, sorry, meaning we extend a bit lower down. Uh, uh, we we want to look at the cervical region to look for any tandem, uh, tandem lesion or tendon occlusion. So tendon lesion would be like, uh, if you have a keratid stenosis, that, that we call as tendon lesion. We have an infarct uh, in the brain, and also you have infarct within the, you, you have a tendon lesion as well. And then uh, that section is also uh, uh, something that can actually contribute to stroke. So that's also, also important to look at the CTA keratid. And then, uh, like I said, for good collectors with favorable outcome. So this, you don't have to know. It's basically how we do uh, CTA, CTA in uh, when we assess for collaterals. We scan the patient uh, four times, plain, early arterial, late arterial, and delayed. And then this is how we basically uh, we basically uh, do uh, what we call that uh, scoring. So if you have high score of four or five, there will be a good collaterals, and all this yellow three and two will be uh, moderate, and poor will be zero and one. Okay. So uh, CT perfusion, 
we uh, it's something uh, we try to introduce. Uh, okay, just before that, I just wanna highlight that this uh, CTA cholesterol can be done in many many hospitals. Can be done in many many CT scan. If you have a, a hospital with sixteen slices, you can sixteen slices scan. This is doable. Okay, so even for perfusion, actually, we can actually do uh, uh, in many many hospitals, but uh, some are not equipped with the uh, software. But maybe in the future, we try to do more and more of this to actually to cater our uh, stroke patients in, I mean, not just the Klang Valley and other, other centers as well. So uh, if you have not a very advanced machine, you can basically just look at certain area. You don't have to scan the whole brain. Let's say your, your concern is basically this uh, MCA, then so you basically, we just scan the supratentorial region. If it's post-circulation, then we just look at the post-circulation. So we, we just make do with whatever we have. So basically, in situ fibrillation, you want to look at the mismatch between between whatever I'm going to show later. So the better, the greater the mismatch, the better the outcome for the patient. And the limitation, however, uh, if you have if you perform CT perfusion, you will increase time, meaning you you are doing more scans for the patient. And then the radiation dose also will be increased, as well as the contrast dose. So for patient, for if you perform a normal CT, you use the contrast is less thicker than contrast when you use for CTA. So for the dose wise, okay, this is one example when you uh, perform a CT brain for the patient, it's basically, we call it as in, the dose will be two millisievert. That's roughly about 100 chest X-ray. So if you do a, a CTA brain, there'll be more than double of that uh, number. And then if you do CTA and CT perfusion, there'll be more and more. So we have to really, you have to really uh, see how it, is that really important for, for us to perform all these CT scan because it carries uh, some risk as well. Okay, so this is a bit, I think it would be a very, ad, quite advanced, even for me before I joined uh, uh, Nero, Nero is, is quite advanced for me, but I tried to, I tried to just go through briefly. So this is one of my favorite because it's the only, one of the scans that are, that are colorful. You can actually see, uh, we don't just deal with you know gray and white. Now we have more and more colors. So basically, in CT perfusion, what we try to do is to look for the contrast. We actually try to measure the first pass of contrast into the blood structure. I mean, into, into the blood circulation. So if you have when the moment the contrast passes the particular structure, it will actually become bright because contrast is causes the brightness. So we want to look at that. So we have for uh for the CT perfusion, what we're trying to look is at the, uh, these parameters. So ignore the long long names, but just look at the volume flow and the time. So for example, this one is the MTT, which is the time. So uh, when you have a stroke here, this particular area, this patient earlier has shown you, stroke at this particular region, right? So basically the whole MCA showing that because there's occlusion, so this, the flow of the contrast to this area will be increase because it's longer, so it will be increased. So the time is high, okay? And then we try to look at the flow. Flow is basically this area as well. So we compare it. So this area is the match. So at the area where there is increased time of blood or contrast to reach the, the brain, also showing low flow at the particular region. Okay, now the, the, the determining factor is the volume. So the volume is, volume of blood reaching the brain. So at that particular region, which this region, actually not so bad. You can have, this one is low. Dark mean low, bright, all this very bright mean high. So this one is low. So this is the core infarct. The rest are just the penumbra. So this patient is a uh, very good candidate for uh, intervention or for uh, thrombolysis or thrombectomy, okay? So just when, uh, uh, you know, I know it's quite difficult to understand that. So I tried to, you know, I was thinking how, how do I make it simpler? So I take this analogy, I hope it will be helpful. So just take the blood uh, as blood within the vessel is like a car trying to reach the kampong during Raya. Okay. So when you have this car and then unfortunately there is a construction on the road. So construction on the road, if you want to put it in the brain, it will be like a vascular compromise. Uh, vascular compression, I mean, uh, thrombosis within the brain, okay? So what happened to the time now? What happens to the flow? If you have a car and then there's a construction, okay? So obviously they'll be jammed, right? 
So what happened to the time if there is jam? It will be increased. The time for these people, these people, this car to reach Kampung will be increased. And then the flow, meaning it's jam, is very slow. It's very, it's also decreased. So, so now you have, uh, whenever, whenever you have an occlusion, whether it's very, really bad or it's not so bad, so basically this will never change. You will always, time is increased, flow is decreased. So apply it to the brain, MTT, which is the time will be increased, the flow will be decreased, okay? So like I said, if the jam, I mean, the construction is just, uh, is very bad, so they have to close the road. Okay, if, you, if they have to close the road, meaning what happens to the number of people reaching Kampung? Okay, so now there's no, no more road. I mean, the people can't reach their Kampung. So Kampung is basically empty. So what happens to the people in Kampung now? It will be reduced. So the flow is reduced. So this is basically, if you want to look at this, this is basically a very bad Raya. So people don't go back to Raya. So this is basically a core infarct. So core infarct, you have increased time because of the jam, increased flow because of the jam, and people not reaching Kampung because of total closure. So you have, this is, in conclusion, this is basically a core infarct. But what happened if the, the construction is not so bad, basically you have, uh, you have, just roadblock, but you can still pass through, okay? So uh, the time will be increased, definitely. Flow will be decreased, meaning it's still jammed. But what happens to the people reaching Kampung? It still be the same, right? Because there's no total occlusion. I mean, there's no total jam. The road is still, instead of two way, now it become one way. All people will reach, but it'll be delayed, it'll be jammed. So normal, I mean, the normal amount of same number of people will reach Kampung. So, RCBV is normal. So this is basically not so bad, Raya, despite the jam. So this is the penumbra. So I hope you can understand that. So if you have like a increased time, decreased flow, and a normal volume, so basically that's the penumbra. So uh, this is just the flow chart, and another, another way of explaining it. So MTT and flow will be always reduced, and the RCBV is the determining sequence. So you have, like I said, you have this bar here. Low is this color. So you're basically just playing with colors. Low is color, red is high. So for time, if it's high, it's red. So mean it's bad, bad. Because time is high, it's bad in brain. But if you have uh, red in flow and volume, that's good because high flow, good flow, good volume. But if you have blue or purple, that's bad, okay? For example, in this particular patient, we have the profusion, this is all bad. This is all increased, okay? Jammed, like just now. And then, because of the jam, there is also reduced flow at this particular area. We compare, we compare this area. And then we compare to the volume. Not all the area, not all the area basically have low volume, okay? So all, only this area is low volume, the rest, this part and this bit are still normal or high. So this is core infarct, this is the penumbra. So this patient will be like somewhere around 50%, okay? So that's how CT perfusion is. Okay, so MRI brain would be uh, very advanced. Not all centers will do this. And I think in Klang Valley, only UPM do uh, MRI brain for stroke. They don't do, uh, they don't really do uh, CT, CT brain, CT scan as part of their uh, uh, early management. So because it's time consuming and then you scan patient multiple times, meaning you don't scan like CT scan, you scan once and then you get all the images by just changing the window. Uh, but you really have to scan patient. Let's say you wanna do all the sequence. So you'll be scanning patient all this sequence, okay? So once two minutes, two minutes, something like that, okay? But however, it's superior to CT in detecting small vessel ischemia and brainstem in fact, because of brainstem, I've, I've mentioned earlier, we have, uh, it's prone for, sorry, it's prone for artifacts. So brainstem, normally CT, MRI brain is better. And then we can, we have this particular sequence that actually can detect very early changes and even the small ones we can actually pick up, okay? For example, this is, you don't have to remember, this is, uh, I think it's, it's just, uh, it's okay just for the radiologist to, to know. So just one particular thing that you have to see here is the DWIDC. This is, uh, infarct will manifest very early in this 
particular sequence. Okay, so just one of the patient, one uh, a patient of mine. So we have infarct here. This is DWI. This is ADC. It's corresponding this area, other, uh, and then you can see the changes on flare and T two, and then also changes on T one. But there's no evidence of hemorrhage. So that's the goodness of MRI. We have so many information you can get. You can get from one uh, from 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 the multiple sequences, but you know, it will take some time and this will delay the management if this, this is what you want to use as part of the uh, stroke uh, protocol. Okay, so we also have MRI pollution, the same, the same concept is applied, MTT, you have also MTT, RCBF, RCBB, also the same thing. If you wanna, if you wanna perform uh, perfusion for stroke, so you will be uh, using the same concept, okay? So those are the earlier ones are basically talking about uh, acute infarct. Now we move on to the subacute infarct. So it's basically 48 hours to two weeks and following the insult. And it has this up and down, up and down phase. So initially it will be increases, edema will be increases, mass effect will be increases. Then after sometimes it will start to decrease. So initially within the first week, I would say first week, the infarct will start to go up. I mean, the edema will start to go up. Things will be become more apparent. In fact, will be more uh, obvious, and after sometimes it will start to decrease, and then uh, hemorrhagic transformation will happen also within this period, uh, sometimes uh, forty-eight hours and beyond. Uh, but it's not it normally doesn't cause clinical deterioration, and they say it's indicating early 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 vascular decarnization. If it's not big enough, it won't cause uh, so harm a harming patient. Okay, uh, so like I said, the findings are variable. And then the initial area, which is ill-defined, we can't really see, we can't really make out the, the impact will become more and more apparent. Uh, for example, in this particular case, uh, the initial part we can't really see. And then after sometimes you can, after uh, two days, there's area of hypodensity, edema is increasing, and then it starts to, uh, uh, develop hemorrhagic transformation, this hyperdensity, and then the edema starts to decrease. Okay, for if you were to give uh, for radiology, um, even, I mean, not for just radiology, for everyone, uh, when you start to give contrast in this period of time, it will be very, very confusing because subacute infarcts will manifest like they can have bizarre enhancement and it can look like a tumor and that will, you know, throw you off like, okay, could this be tumor? And then the symptoms will be like, because in subacute phase, so you, the symptoms will be like not really clear cut in fact. So when a patient comes with it within in subacute uh, period, it will be very difficult for us to to uh, uh, when you start giving contrast, it will cause you know it will throw you, throw you off from the diagnosis of infarct. So all infarct is basically uh, the, the brain start to shrink. There will be loss of volume. So if you have loss of volumes, you can start seeing the CSF will fill up the space in order to you know to make the the pressure equilibrium to be in equilibrium. So sometimes if you have loss of volume here, CSF space will be enlarged and then the ventricles will be retracted. So that's why if it's big enough, sometimes we call it encephalomalacia. So if you read this in our report, you don't have to be like, oh, what is this? Is this a new diagnosis? No, it depends. If you have a this is basically you have a area of brain, large area of brain, which shown. Which has, shrink, which has shrunk and uh, they'll be cause, causing uh, dilatations of the CSS spaces. Okay, so uh, imaging findings will be sharp, sharply delineated. So you can see if it's in the MCA, it will be sharply delineated. It's no longer ill-defined like stroke, uh, like acute, and it will involve the gray and white matter. Similar, similar uh, theory apply here. And then we have enlargement of the cell side and ventricles. Sometimes, like this one, we have large area of infa in the MCA territory causing dilatations of the ventricles. And then uh, sometimes you can have calcification, although this, this is quite rare. Okay, so lacuna infarcts is basically a small, small infarcts. Uh, it's normally within the basal ganglia, the thalamus, the brainstem. So uh, it's like 3 to 15 m mm. So how do we actually decide whether it's acute or chronic? We look at the, the margin of the, of the infarct. So if it's like very uh, fluffy, you, don't really, you can't really see the margin that is normally like a uh, acute infarct. Uh, and then 
So this is very subjective. When it comes to lacuna, it's sometimes very subjective. But if you really, you can really see like a punch out lesion that's clear cut or old infarct or chronic infarct. But if you have the margin like this one, sometimes you, some people will call it, still call this as subacute infarct. Okay, so I think that's all. And just uh, a few cases, um, but before that, we go through the initial cases that I've shown. Initial case that I've shown you. So, for this particular patient, what we have is basically here the the left sided body weakness. So, weakness is on the left side. So we try to look at the right side of the brain. Okay, right side of the brain. I think at first glance, I would say this is this could be normal. But we try to look hard hard enough. We can actually see that. The length, the cardiac nucleus is a bit, a bit uh, hypodense. That's like you know after knowing it. retrospectively, I could make that you know appear nicer. But then I changed to the window that I love so much. So you can compare the hypodensity here. Okay, white matter will will appear hypodense. It will appear like you know all these finger like projections into the gray matter. But as you compare here and here, it's basically different. So you have to make sure that the brain is within the, at the same level, then you try to change this window. You can, you can actually see that this is darker than the other side. So there's hypodensity, hypodense area here. Compared to here as well, you can actually see the area is darker. Okay. And then another thing is you can also, also compare the salsi. Salsi in this particular region, you can still see CSS spaces, but here no, no CSS space because of the mass effects. So this is a very subtle changes of hyperacute infarct. And then uh, see, mentioned insula, insula ribbon. So we have this sulcation here on the left side, which is normal. Unfortunately, on the right side, it starts to stretch out. It become like elongated because of the mass effect. And then you lose the digitations or lose the finger-like projection of the insula ribbon. So this is loss of insula ribbon sign. So for the same patient, we perform a CTA. So true enough, we have a, a thrombosis at, at the M1 segment, uh, M1 segment here. And then uh, we compare it to the other side, which is nice and juicy, juicy, vessel, juicy vessels. But this one is uh, truncated. So we have a right MCA thrombus uh, causing a right MCA infarct. So 48 hours later, uh, I think this one this patient we uh, we thrombolyzed. Uh, Forty hours, uh, hours later, we, we still see the the area uh, it become subacute now, and then now the area become more conspicuous, more apparent, and so the infarct involving large area is basically in, involving the um, the basic ganglia, the insular region, M1, M2, M3, and then higher up probably. M4, I mean uh, M M5, uh, and a bit before M4, M uh, M4. So M6 is uh, is saved. So probably just if we were to uh, to score it here, but we do it uh, basically it's like nine. But uh, in fact, I mean aspect score is used just pre-treatment, not post-treatment. Okay, so uh, the next case would be 59 years old with right side body weakness. So right side we try to look on the left side. Okay, so where's the abnormality? Is it on the right or the left? Is it, okay, first of all, is it normal or not normal? So what you can see here, the gray matter, compare it to the other side, like I said, always symmetrical, compare it to the other side. You can see this is dark. We don't have this hyperdense, the crowded nucleus. And here also, we don't have the lentiform nucleus, which is also lost, or, uh, loss of basic ganglia sign. And then we have CSS spaces here, but we don't have here. Okay, that's debatable. You can still have a bit here, but you know, since we have the, all these supportive findings, and one thing that's very obvious is the asymmetry of the ventricle. The ventricles, you can see there's a bulge of parenchyma into the frontal horn of the left lateral ventricle. So that's supportive of, there's actually mass effect into the ventricle. So ventricles is very, very, very important. Apart from the, the cell side, you have the best thing is look at the ventricle first. There is effacement of one sided or brain parenchyma and it's daily with the symptoms. So, yeah. So, what is the abnormality, which I've mentioned earlier? So, we have the loss of basic ganglia definition, not for insular ribbon, and the mass effect. So, next case is uh, 62 years old, reduced consciousness. So, 
and this is a bit of a bizarre appearance. You know, some people will be like, okay, we have one dot here, another dot here. So we do in my, you know, favorite uh, windowing. So we have one dot here, another dot large area here. This is basically not in MCA territory. This is involving the thalamus. This is in a posterior circulation in fact. So we have thalamus one, one. we also have at the uh, occipital lobes. Okay. So 65 years old, generalized body weakness. So even from the symptoms, we were like, okay, stroke ke tak ni? Okay, so we'll be like, okay, not sure, right? So what do we do? Okay, it's difficult, we don't, okay, the ventricles are symmetrical. Okay, we don't, we can still see the basal ganglia, the definition, the thalamus definition. Then we can see the gray matter outside, the white matter inside. Sal, uh, ventricles are not asymmetrical. Salsi, okay, more or less the same. Okay. And then we change to the window. Then we can see clearly now the white matter here, white matter there, and then all this uh, white matter within within its intended location. And then we have the gray matters outside. So this is normal. Is it normal or abnormal? If it's abnormal, would it be on the left or on the right? So this is because you don't your symptom. Your symptoms is basically generalized body weakness. So you can't really point out which which area you have you want to pay attention to. So that was basically, sorry, that was actually a normal scan. Okay. But just bear in mind the 65 years old, CSF, CSF spaces are more prominent because of the uh, uh, atrophy after sometimes. Okay, then we move on to the next one. So we have a large area weight shape. So this is what I call as weight shape area in the MCA territory. Okay. So like I said, if it's very big, so now the ventricles is compressed to the other side, you have a bit of non-significant midline shift to the other side. And then the south side is totally effaced on the right, on the left side, the right side, you can compare us on the right side. So basically we have a large occlusion. This is basically will cause, this is basically because of inf, uh, occlusion at the proximal MCA. So this is within the uh, subacute probably in subacute or uh, subacute phase of the infarct. Okay, I uh, think this is, will be the last uh, case. Uh, we have right side body weakness. So we look at this particular region. We try to look at the center first. Look at the midbrain, uh, look at the uh, uh, caudate nucleus, the lentiform nucleus, can't really see that much, probably because of, this is because of the cut. Lah. So, so side, we try to, I mean, ventricle, we try to compare. Okay, first, more or less the same, right? So south side also more or less the same. Then we go a bit down, you see the lentiform here. I know it's quite difficult to see, it's okay. The one is fine. Okay, the insular region is more or less the same. But then we go a little bit up, then we start to see this area hypodense. And then uh, it's, very, it's basic, basically quite small to call it like a full blown uh, MCA territory infarct. Uh, so when we do the, the windowing, especially we can see it's much, much clearer. So it's impossible to miss it when you do this window. So basically patient has got a uh, lacuna infarct on the uh, left corona radiata. Okay, so these are my references. I think uh, that's all. So this is a very small family of ours from uh, neuroradiology HKL. So four fellows and three trainees at the moment. So I think that's all from me. If you, if you have any question, you can ask. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harudin. I think um, the the part yang uh, ada kereta dan jam, that one was really, really interesting. Uh, and also, I think I can remember better. Okay, I think we have one question from, um, just hold on, eh? I saw it just now. Um, kat mana, eh? um, from, just hold on. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Mana tu? Dr. Shafiq Sulaiman. Uh, Dr. Harudin, for CTA brain, is it compulsory to capture image from the level of aortic arch or imaging from the circle of release is enough? Okay, for CTA brain, normally, um, if you if you plan to perform thrombectomy for the patient, uh, it, you have to do a, a, to involve the carotid. But if you just want to look for the thrombosis, you know, for uh, for some other reasons, you don't have to do carotid. But if normally, if you if you just want to, we don't normally 
use CTA to diagnose stroke. We use, you use it for, to look for any uh, large vessel occlusion in order to do something about it, you know, because it's, it, like I said, it's higher, higher radiation, uh, more contrast for, for the patient, so higher risk, so we don't simply do it. But if you were to do it, it's better if you perform a, a carotid as well to look for any tendon occlusion, uh, tendon lesion. Tendon lesion means you have uh, ipsilateral, ipsilateral carotid artery stenosis. So if you have a stenosis, it's very difficult for the IR. Sometimes IR will, you know, IR, it's quite difficult for IR to enter. So basically if you do, okay, let's say you perform CTA carotid only, and then you, you see a very nice thrombosis within the M1, it's reachable, it's, it's, it's retractable, but then uh, you, you do not perform the CTA carotid. So IR enter, and then they want to try, but, but there's actually occlusion in the uh, ICA, the extra, extra cranial ICA. So when you want to enter, there is difficulty. They can't. They, they don't really. I mean, they cannot enter. So you know, there's there's no point because there's no point of entry to retract the, uh, to retrieve the thrombus. So that's the importance of doing the CTA carotid. All right. Okay. Great. Um, we have second question. Kana, sorry. I just. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Go. Sorry. Yes. 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 Yeah, I just uh, called. Uh, share my thoughts on that. Irene, thank you. Very very good presentation. Ashraf here. Uh, I totally agree with you when I joined the fraternity in 2016, the issue of CTA proximal from carotid to the brain is actually only, during that time, uh, we thought that it's actually required only for access for the EVT service. Uh, as uh, we are now become more aware of the evidence, uh, I'll just go back to 2013. In 2013, there's a study called SAMPRE study. We know that our CT scan now is good to, uh, yeah, some of the CT scan, I think still quite a lot, you know more. Um, they are not able to look at the intracranial vessels as good, but um, especially in Klang Valley, I think most of the, the CT scan is capable to look at the intracranial disease. So SAMPRE study is basically uh, studying the intracranial disease. If you able to detect uh, called the, the stenosis, uh, then uh, this is within the circle of Willis, then uh, the treatment would be DAPT can be can go up to a minimum of evidence-based 90 days, tiga bulan. So, um, but 1980, 1980 uh, plus, so basically this is about my age. So uh, there's a study called Crest and Nesket. And uh, obviously those days is actually carotid Doppler, but we all know carotid Doppler in Asia will take about three to nine months or a year. So this is even more worse uh, stroke and the stroke outcome will be as similar as atrofibrillation. So who, uh, if you're treating stroke, you know that the stroke startup will be severe. Therefore, carotid assessment with a CTA at baseline is, a, is actually the, the easiest way to get it done at baseline. Uh, so, um, but obviously, if for example, you're not going for EVT and IVT, um, uh, called uh, like what Hyrule didn't say just now is, is uh, uh, quite, quite uh, called accurate. So we can do within uh, 48 hours. Why 48 hours? Because of CRES and NASCAD study says, don't touch the carotid within 48 hours because of that will be too high risk. So uh, that's other utility of CTA from carotid to vertex. Uh, not many neurologists able to do carotid uh, ultrasound um, other than radiology, obviously in Malaysia, and um, we have lack of TCD. That's to to counter back the sampris. That's why CTA is uh, is actually um, in majority part of the world. We already not doing uh, uh, carotid Doppler and TCD, especially in the developed country. But we are talking about Malaysia, and we are something in the middle or something wanted like that. So I hope that will also help. Uh, called uh, answering a bit of the confusion about why CTA in a certain center, especially now in the stroke center. Thank you very much, Ashraf, uh, for a very useful insight uh, in, in complement of uh, whatever that uh, Dr. Hairudin has mentioned. Uh, Hairudin, nak tambah apa-apa? For that said, we want to do CTA for uh, you know, just for look for any stenosis in the brain. Normally, in what we practice in HKL, normally we don't uh, we don't do that at the acute setting. Uh, if you let's say you're not you know, 
the stroke, the stroke, the stroke is beyond the treatable the treatable window, so normally we do it a bit later. Sometimes I, I don't know whether it's uh, the the uh, whether it's because of the uh, our capability of you know listing the patients or not. I'm not very sure about about that. But normally we do it a bit later within a week or sometimes even outpatient, just because uh, some uh, new I mean neurologists want to, to know whether there is intracranial stenosis. They they can have a uh, double antiplatelet for that. All right, thank you. Um, okay, I think I'll go on to the second question from Dr. Lau. Um, Prof used to mention that lacuna no need to comment acute or chronic. What is the consensus on this matter? Um, normally, uh, because because of the, the, the problem that I have mentioned earlier, because if lacuna is sometimes it's very small, uh, so if you have uh, if you have the symptoms and then it's very ill defined you and then it still with the symptoms so basically it I, I normally will just will mention for example for this particular patient uh, sorry uh, it's quite ill defined to just you know dismiss it as uh, old infarct so this I would call as uh, this I'll definitely give now I'm not sure if, uh, for other radiologists but uh, what we what we normally practice is we do give uh, we do comment whether it's old or uh, acute even for lacuna infarct unless unless it's incidental so sometimes incidental because uh, incidental you patient I mean some, more, some of lacuna infarct they don't present with symptoms uh, so if it's incidental patient coming for something else so probably that's that's when you wanna call it just lacuna infarct rather than uh, acute or chronic uh. I'm not sure, but I, I will definitely go for describing them. Depends on the appearance, whether it's ill-defined or well-defined. Then I'm just call it acute or uh, chronic. I mean, acute, or, yeah, acute or chronic. I I called. I can I just comment. Called. Uh, I totally agree with Harudin, and I will appreciate that acute uh, called uh, uh, called uh, 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 mentioning about that because of if it were not to be mentioned. Um, sometimes yeah, in majority of the center, they are actually using WhatsApp still. They, they didn't get the DICOM or even as uh, I already mentioned just now, it's actually a radiograph. So the hard copy again. So uh, by mentioning the acute, uh, we, we know that uh, for our IVT, for example, intravenous thrombolysis, we will not, we will not, we will not touch the patient uh, for, for IVT because of it's a, it's a recent stroke. So uh, that, that's the limitation of uh, uh, called IVT uh, and just to touch a bit of lacuna basically for for us lacuna sometimes the limitation is actually clinical assessment so when this smile we say it's lacuna in fact uh, lacuna is actually a specific entity for a patient that suffer a stroke due to hypertension if you do histology basically in Malaysia but the, the, definitely there's no way to get histology uh, which is involving lipohalinosis so basically uh, you need to then correlate with anatomy as uh, I didn't uh, show here. Maybe there's a small perforator due to hypertension. Then the 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 the, call, the stroke happened. Uh, so this is uh, due to hypertension. Must have hypertension. So uh, a small stroke at the cortex, for example, resulting in a mild stroke, lacuna syndrome by by name, but it's actually it's not lacuna. It's actually a cortical stroke. Then you need to investigate of embolic stroke or thrombotic stroke. Thank you very much. Oh, very, very useful input. Nah, because I think most of the time we say that, oh, this is lacuna stroke, then discharge, then, you know, patients get another recurrent stroke. Um, so pity the patient last, but normally the second stroke and above will be more disastrous. Kan? So, okay, we move on to the uh, subsequent question. I think this person from um, Dr. Ibnu Muhammad asking about a posterior circulation aspect score. So what do you think of it? Okay, uh, we do have aspect score for posterior circulations also. Uh, I but I I myself don't don't really memorize it. If we, if we were to use it, then we have to refer back to the uh, to the book. But um, but if you if you want to use it, it's okay. But I I I personally I've never used it. I've never reported it before. And then sometimes because it's because of uh, posterior circulation is quite difficult for um, uh, for acute stroke. Uh, normally, patients uh, for 
posterior stroke is normally we, patient will present a bit later and then the diagnosis also be, become later. So by the time to by the time you want to give the the uh, aspect score for posterior circulation, it's it's already delayed. There's no, I mean there's no point of giving it anymore. But but that's just that's just my opinion. Lah. If you if you can detect it early, I mean you want to use it, then that, that's fine. Because but I personally have never have never used it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Harudin, one question from me. Uh, I always get confused about usage of MRI in terms of uh, diffusion-weighted imaging and also flare. How different and do you use it? Like when you scan patient, you just do it? Ke macam mana? Okay, for, uh, um, for centers which have uh, which use MRI as part of their uh, stroke protocol so normally they will have very limited sequence they, they don't go they don't go all out with the you know sometimes we do more than 10 sequences so we just do certain sequences for example we have dwi uh adc and then uh, flare and then uh, sometimes they add on gre and also mra to look for the vessels so uh, your question is basically do we do it or not is it uh, so we we do um this is DWIDC is a must, and flare also also is a must. So DWIDC will detect very early, very very early changes. So basically, DWI we scan only once, but the ADC is a you know post post processing. Then we produce this image. So we compare it if you have hyper intensity, uh, it's bright, and then hyper intensity on ADC. So that's basically a patient has got diffusion restriction. And then you compare it to flare. So basically, instead of using like in perfusion, we we compare between uh, RCBV and then RCBF and also M, the time. But for here, we compare DWADC and the flare to actually to make the diagnosis of whether this patient has got uh, DWADC mismatch, uh, DWI flare mismatch or not. So it's not really indicating of uh, core infarct or penumbra, but especially they use this as part of the way of, if it's bigger here, smaller here, that is, will be greater mismatch, meaning patient is, would benefit from uh, treatment either thrombolysis or thrombectomy. So this, I, I would say if you, if you were to choose, these two would be uh, important uh, sequences and the rest would be complementary, but need to be done, you know, throughout like bleed, GRE to, to, to look for bleed and also MRI to look for any vessel occlusion. Okay, thank you very much. Um, anyone else want to add on anything or you would like to ask? Sekejap rasa macam ada satu ni. Yeah. Um, from uh, Dr. Zubair, Dr. Ashraf would like to ask regarding the need of an ultrasound Doppler carotid artery even if the patient had done a previous CTA carotid and CTA brain. From your clinical perspective, uh, is it still needed? i.e. to further assess the intima or soft atherosclerotic plaques which will further alter the management. Thank you. That's, that's a very interesting question, but Hayudin maybe can, can add on to because of uh, uh, in a in the majority of the new scan, because I'm I'm having the, the call the luxury of a new scan. So I can go detail to the to the vessels and can see the, the call even the wall of the, the atheromas. Uh, in quite the majority of the time, except we have another machine which is a bit difficult to interpret. So, in the, uh, if I use the the usual high quality scan, uh, for me, I, I I'm not I don't do uh, routine carotid Doppler anymore. So that's also reduced the burdens to the radiology uh, in in, uh, in in one aspect. Uh, but I definitely uh, in a patient that uh, if if you want borderline stenosis. Uh, it's, it looks like forty percent. It looks like fifty percent. That's a flat. So then, um, our call radiology click usually because of when when we have a stenosis, usually we have MDT. So we have interventional radiologists, uh, diagnostic radiologists, vascular surgeon, uh, stroke neurologists. We sit down together. Then in certain patient, we do ask for carotid Doppler to assess the the call the surfaces of the atheroma. Yeah. I didn't have a popular guitar. Yeah, I think I'm not sure about the other type of scan. Mm, normally, if for radiology, if it's uh, uh, if there is stenosis there, normally if you want to quantify the 
the degree of stenosis then you perform uh, if you let's say you you you, you found there's actually a uh, stenosis in the carotid artery so you wanted to uh, further know how 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 bad the stenosis is you can actually look at the lumen at the same, at the same time you can actually further support it with a uh, carotid artery doppler but uh, sometimes uh, this is because you could do different different place different uh, practice like in back, back back then when i was in um uh, if you have a stenosis on cta we still perform cta carot i mean artrosan carotid to actually to quantify how bad it is because uh, the surgeon will want to know whether if it's you know it's, it's, the stenosis would cause uh, i mean the, the 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 plug will actually cause really really significant stenosis then only they will do something about it if it's not then they don't so uh, for in hashkel we don't i don't uh, i really have a carotid artery doppler probably because my mo will do it so no, i'm not very sure but uh, that's why, uh, for from my experience from UM, is they still need uh, an ultrasound if they plan to do something about it. Let's say patient is a fit young patient, so they want to do uh, uh, from I mean and and atherectomy, so they will ask for ultrasound to complement the CT scan. Yeah, maybe I just add on that. Uh, uh, Paul, uh, usually I, I totally agree. We still do the carotid Doppler. In, in the borderline uh, stenosis. So if, for example, like 70% and above stenosis, uh, it's just quite clear, 90% stenosis, carotid doppler, we, we don't do. Um, but uh, if they are about 50%, in uh, evidence base is basically uh, not clear. So then we do a, a call, we need to look at the carotid doppler with the peak systolic pressure uh, gradient. So then uh, if it were to be significant, then uh, the surgeon will be more confident to go in. Uh, otherwise, yeah, we don't do carotid Doppler. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. In in majority of the time, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we have a very fruitful discussion. Anyone else want to add on anything or ask some more question? To um, I think can ask to anyone because we have our uh, Dr. Ashraf, who is uh, the lead uh, stroke neurologist. Uh, we have Dr. Hairudin who is interested in neurology. So all these people basically, uh, they they will they will work together and also try to provide the best care for the patients. Lah. And also we, we do have uh, um, from other fraternities such as emergency physicians and so forth. So ada apa apa lagi that we would like to discuss and clarify? Uh, Dr. Hairudin, I'm Chow from Penang. Uh, I just like to ask uh, for the dance MCA sign, right? Because usually I find that uh, a lot of patients uh, uh, also have like the, the, the MCA looks a bit dense. So when do we uh, really call it a dense MCA sign? Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, that's a very good question. So first first of all, some, sometimes uh, the most important thing, you have to compare it to the other side. And then sometimes you'll be like, oh, okay, the other side pun, uh, this looks brighter than you know how how bright you will say is bright uh, how bright is is actually brighter so if you want to go you know uh, really quantitative about it you can actually measure the hsu hsu is basically we measure uh, the the value of density of a certain structure for those the non radiological non radiological uh, colleagues so hsu we measure it so when to look uh, normally if you if you take more than 20 difference uh, hsu then that's considered as significantly difference of uh, density but bear in mind these things can happen where you have high hematocrit i've seen i've seen one case really appear like uh, you know we've given the contrast so we were like really really asking the radi radiographer did you give contrast or not did you give contrast or not because why the brain i mean the vessel looks so bright so in the case of like high hematocrit that will appear as, as bright as well so that will actually that you, do, you don't use that uh, sign in that particular, in the patients like that. Lah. So for that, for the case that I've mentioned, when we checked the hematocrit, it was actually 70. So, and then the contrast look, I mean, the brain, city brain looks like a contrasted, contrasted city, city brain. That's that actually very, very interesting case. I hope that, that answer your question. Thank you. Yeah, uh, call. Uh, I wouldn't maybe uh, call. We need more neuroradiologists, as what you are now doing. Um, uh, called uh, during your presentation, I think uh, because of uh, uh, here 
uh, emergency physician kan clinician so uh, before you order a scan is always uh, called there's a there's a clinical indication so basically for example like what the chow asking just now is about uh, dense vessel signs so if you are suspected in left mca for example then uh, uh call you then uh, call uh, have a dense vessel sign on the left mca then that must be something that you then chase dr hairudin so is it really a clot and uh, uh then dr hairudin uh, or uh, some of us in uh, stroke we able to then uh, call uh, check on the hounsfield unit uh, i would take a uh, call 45 and above and uh, if correlating then that can be a, a significant dense vessel sign so just just to share clinical indication prior to that is very important correlates that with the uh, call imaging uh, parameters that you have and um, dense vessel sign in a good clinical setting can be accurate in 80% of the, the time because another 20% is old clot like Harudin mentioned just now is actually a pseudo dense vessel signs or basically it is a uh, so the 20% will be negative but the, the polycythemia will be different uh, another one is anemia. They don't get a uh, nice dense vessel sign. Uh, then uh, call stenosis patient and old clot. There will, won't be a positive dense vessel sign. So negative dense vessel sign in 20% of the time didn't mean there's no stroke. Lah. No, no occlusion, I mean, no thrombosis. But 80% of the time it correlates. Then uh, what we need to do Harudin, is to teach the interventional radiologist back that they are not going blind to the brain. They know where's the clot. They can pre-plan what is the length of the clot and uh, where to go. So th that's the best thing about having a very good imaging discussion like this. Okay, great. Uh, anything else from the floor that you would like to discuss? Okay, if we do not have any further question, uh, I think I would like to thank um, Dr. Hairudin for his time today. Um, actually, he was a bit nervous uh, when I first asked him the question, can you give a talk? But I think he presented quite well and he had put a lot of effort in putting uh, uh, the real cases uh, and we really appreciate uh, all the presentations and the new uh, information that we gathered from the, your slides, your teaching and also from the discussion that we just had. <laughs> So um, if you do not have uh, anything else, I think um, I would like to request everyone to um, switch on your video because we uh, we would like to take a group photo of everyone. Okay. Um, today, I think among the highest uh, number of participants that we got, we reached just now about 62, 61. So thank you again for joining. I think some of them also from uh, HKL punya team juga. Yeah? Are you there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, that's great. That's great. Because I I at least I don't believe that we work separately. Uh we should work together because if you're not sure, then we can confirm with other people's can. Okay, so can you please switch on so that I can take uh, uh, everyone's photo?